librarians here at the Hudson Library. This meeting is being recorded. So I just wanted to let you know about a couple programs that are coming up really quickly. Uh, October 3rd at 7 p.m., we're going to have Anthony Satin. He's going to talk about nomads, the wanderers who shaped our world. Then October 5th, we're going to have, uh, maybe you've heard of him, William Shatner. Yes, he's going to be talking to us on Zoom about his newest book, Boldly Go, Reflections on a Life of Awe and Wonder. So sign up for those and look up for new programs on hudsonlibrary.org. We'd like to thank the Learned Owl for providing copies of this wonderful book here. It's the new book here. Uh, and you can purchase that. We'll have a little bit of a link there later on to buy it from our local bookstore. And uh, don't worry, we'll have time later on for questions. So now let's talk to the author here. So we have with us Steve Brusetti, and he's gonna be talking to us about this book here, The Rise and Fall of Dinosaurs. He's the author of internationally bestseller, Rise and Fall of Dinosaurs, A New History of the Lost World, as well as other numerous books, such as Pinocchio Rex and Day of the Dinosaurs and Field Guy to Dinosaurs. He has a PhD from Columbia University and an American paleontologist who teaches at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And he has named over 15 new species of, I'm hopefully gonna get this right, but it's Quianosaurus Pinocchio Rex, I think is what it's called. And they're Raptor as Zenhyeonglong, I think, and some other ancient mammals, but I'm sure he'll probably be able to pronounce those a little bit better than me. So now I'll turn it over to our author. All right, thank you very much. All right, so uh, a big thanks for the invitation uh, and um, greetings from Scotland where it's quite late in the evening, but I'm glad to be able to join you. So hopefully you're all hearing me well. Uh, and I'm just gonna start sharing my slides here in a moment. So, all right, so let's dive into mammals. You guys are all ready. So, um, my name's Steve. Uh, I recently wrote this book called The Rise and Reign of the Mammals. Now, uh, maybe some of you uh, read my previous book, uh, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, and uh, if so, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and you, you would know from that book that I, I, I started my career uh, in paleontology and in research as a, as a dinosaur specialist and that's what I did my PhD on and that's what a lot of my work has been done uh, is focused on over the years and I'm very fortunate to be able to do this work at the University of Edinburgh far from home I grew up not too far from where you guys are I grew up in north central Illinois and uh, just through the vagaries of the academic life I ended up here in Scotland at one of the world's great universities I think and a very old university a university that goes back to the 1580s a university where the the science of geology was basically founded here and Scotland itself is a country with a rich fossil record including uh, some emerging dinosaurs that we're finding. So I love dinosaurs. I've written about dinosaurs. I'll continue to work on dinosaurs. But the more I study dinosaurs, the more I've started to wonder about what happened after the dinosaurs exited the stage. And that's in part the focus of my new book, The Rise and Reign of the Mammals. Uh, and what I do in this book is tell the entire story uh, of mammal history, or at least I try to tell that story of 325 million year journey leading from our distant ancestors and uh, to us and all the other mammals that share our world today from bats and whales to elephants and monkeys and kangaroos and dogs and cats and bears and everything in between now the way the story is often told i think the way a lot of us think about it the way it's implied to be in a lot of museum exhibits uh, and uh, in some books and films and so on, is that the dinosaurs had their day, they died out, and then the mammals evolved to take their place. And that's partially true, partially false. As we'll see, no doubt the mammals did take the place of the dinosaurs. And the mammals now today wear that crown that the dinosaurs once wore as the diverse, dominant, preeminent animals on land. But mammals were able to take that crown from the dinosaurs because they outlasted the dinosaurs. Actually, mammals go all the way back to the time of the dinosaurs, and their ancestors go back even further. And so I want to tell you the broad outlines of that 
whole story of mammal evolution today. And of course, you can read all about the details in the book if this uh, talk piques your interest. So rather than warble on here, because we have 325 million years to cover, and I want to leave time for questions, um, let's go all the way back here. Back when the world looked like this, 300 plus million years ago. This was the age of the coal swamps. This was when these huge jungles covered much of the earth, including much of what is now the middle of America and much of what is Europe. And in fact, a lot of the coal that we mine, both in North America and in Europe, comes from this time, from these big trees getting buried and compressed and turned into coal. Now, this was a world that in many ways was alien to us. These trees were not trees that we would be familiar with. These were not flowering plants. These were not trees with fruits or flowers. They weren't evergreen trees, pine trees, anything like that. These were much more primitive trees. These were archaic plants, and they were the first big trees in Earth history. These things would stretch like 100 feet up into the canopy, and they released so much oxygen into the air that animals at this time, many of them were giants. There were dragonflies the size of pigeons. There were millipedes that were bigger than humans. An alien world, but living in the undergrowth were more humble animals, animals with bones, animals that would go out and, and, and split and diversify and eventually produce some of the most familiar animals today. 325 million years later. Now, fossils of this age are actually quite plentiful in parts of the Midwest, including very close to where I grew up in northern Illinois. And there's a place called Mazan Creek where you can find fossils of the plants. You can find fossils of the animals that were living in the swamps and the rivers uh, near these jungles. You can find these things in these ironstone rocks, these little tombs that preserve such a pristine part of, of, of this history. And when I was a teenager growing up in Northern Illinois, I looked for these fossils. This is how I got into paleontology. And there I am with my brothers <laughs> looking through the old, uh, old strip mine uh, piles, the piles that were left behind by those mines. And, the, and, and inside of those, those piles of discarded rock, you can find these these ironstone nodules with fossils inside. Now, what I always wanted to find were nodules with fossil animals, and especially animals with bones, because I knew that around this time in Earth history, this is when a lot of the vertebrates, the animals with bones that live on land, were diversifying. But I never did find one. Uh, incredibly rare, these kind of, of animals. And so what other people have found, though, in other parts of North America at about the same time are some amazing fossils. And one of these things that's known from Canada is this one. It's called Archaeophyrus, and it is what we call a synapsid. And a synapsid is just a fancy name for the ancestors of mammals. Now, what makes Archaeophyrus a synapsid? It has the keystone feature of the group, and it might seem like a subtle thing, but it's an important thing. These synapsids, they evolved a hole in their head behind their eyes. And you can see it there with the arrow. Now we have the same thing. That hole is kind of merged with our eye socket, but when you feel your cheekbone, and you feel behind it, you are feeling that hole. Now what's that hole for? That hole holds big jaw muscles. It allowed these early synapsids to bite really strong and really hard. And that was a, a major evolutionary uh, advancement. This keystone feature of synapsids, it is retained today in the descendants of these synapsids, which are us and the other mammals. So it was this one little feature that set mammals off on their path. Of course, there were no mammals yet. These were the distant ancestors of mammals, but it was that feature, the development of that hole behind the eye for jaw muscles that the synapsid line developed as they split off from the reptiles on the great family tree of life. And one branch of that split would lead to today's reptiles, to crocodiles, to snakes, to lizards, but also to things like turtles and birds and dinosaurs. Those are what we call the diapsids. The other side of that split on the family tree would eventually lead to mammals. 
But for the next several tens of millions of years, there were no mammals yet. These were just the distant ancestors, but there were many groups of archaic synapses that developed the signature features of mammals one by one over time. These were the animals that built up the mammal body plan. And as that interval of time with the coal swamps turned into the next interval of time, which is called the Carboniferous period, the supercontinent of Pangaea came together. And as you can see, you can see that here. All of the land was converging into this one giant landmass that stretched from North Pole to South Pole. This was a harsh world to call home. Vast deserts spread across much of that supercontinent. Only the most well-adapted animals could endure there. And the animals that became dominant across Pangaea, the animals that diversified, that became the top predators and the top plant eaters and food chains all over the world were some of these synapsids. Synapsids like Dimetrodon that you can see here. Now, this animal is a famous animal, an iconic animal. You see it oftentimes mistaken as a dinosaur. You see it in dinosaur toy sets. You see it on dinosaur posters. And it's easy to understand why. It looks kind of dinosaurian. It's big and it's scary and it's toothy and it has this kind of archaic reptilian vibe to it. But as a matter of fact, Dimetrodon is not a dinosaur, and it is a synapsid, not a dinosaur. What that means is Dimetrodon is more closely related to us than it is to a T. rex or a triceratops. And it's synapsids like Dimetrodon that started to evolve some of the most signature features of modern day mammals. Dimetrodon was a ferocious predator. You can see that in its teeth. This was an animal that weighed several hundred pounds with big steak knife teeth. And it would have been the top predator in its ecosystems, the terror of Pangaea during the Permian period. But you can also start to see those teeth in its mouth. They don't all look the same. They're all kind of spiky and sharp, but there's different sizes, different shapes. And this is the first hint of another feature that would come to characterize some synapsids and later became part of the mammal body plan all these different teeth. We have lots of different teeth, incisors and canines and premolars and molars. That's unusual. A T-Rex doesn't have teeth like that. A lizard doesn't have teeth like that. Mammals do. And it was these synapsid ancestors like Dimetrodon that started to differentiate their teeth into weapons that could be used for different things, for grabbing food, for chewing food, and so on. Now, those early synapsids like Dimetrodon, they were ascendant. They lived all over Pangaea. If you were around about 250 million years ago at the end of the Permian period, you would have seen these synapsids living everywhere. And there were big ones and small ones and meat eaters and plant eaters. And they really did seem like they were poised to rule the world for a long time to come. But then something dramatic happened. And these enormous volcanoes started to erupt in what is now Siberia in northern Russia always Russia, not just in human history, but in prehistory too. And these Russian volcanoes, they destroyed the world. These were volcanoes outside the scope of anything humans have ever seen. These were essentially grand canyons in the earth that just opened up and spewed out lava. And that lava covered a very wide area. It covered an area larger than all of Western Europe put together today. But it wasn't the lava that was the real problem. It was all the carbon dioxide and methane, the potent greenhouse gases that came up with the lava. And these led to a runaway global warming, and that caused a mass extinction. And maybe up to 95% of species died out in this extinction. The closest that life has ever come to completely dying out in the four and a half billion year history of Earth and this was devastating to the synapsids. Those dimetrodon type animals and many other synapsids, they almost totally died out, but they didn't. A few species made it through, and one type of synapsid managed to eke its way through the volcanoes and, and, and emerge on the other side into the next interval of time, which is called the Triassic period, and these were very specialized synapses called cynodonts. They were small. They were the size of a miniature dachshund, something like that, uh, you know, a, a house cat, kind of in that realm. 
and they grew fast and they were smart they had big brains they reproduced very quickly they could dig burrows here's a fossilized burrow this is a cat scan of a burrow with one of these cynodons found inside hiding out with an amphibian all snuggled up one of the weirdest fossils you ever see but proof positive that these animals could burrow and as you can see from the last slide they had hair on their body these were all advanced features these particular cynodonts they evolved these new things higher metabolism hair to help retain body heat the ability to dig burrows to hide out and these things help them survive that extinction and proliferate afterwards in this brave new world of the Triassic. And imagine that you were one of these cynodonts that emerged in this world. 95% of the species that were once there are now gone. This is a, a, an empty, ghostly landscape, but one primed with opportunity. And it was on this world where many new different types of plants and animals could get their start, including some small little reptiles that also managed to survive the extinction that began to proliferate and then gave rise to the dinosaurs. So the Triassic was the time of dinosaur origins. The Triassic was also the time that those cynodonts evolved a little bit more, diversified a little bit more, and spun off true mammals. So both dinosaurs and mammals go back to the Triassic period on the supercontinent of Pangaea. Their origin story is the same time and place in the aftermath of that terrible extinction. But of course, from that point onwards, mammals and dinosaurs would have different fates, but their fates would be forever intertwined. The very first true mammals looked like this. They were small. If you were around back then, it would be very easy to miss them. They were basically the size of mice and shrews. So those cynodonts that survived the mass extinction, they shrunk even more. Meanwhile, the dinosaurs were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And just to drive home what these mammals were like, here's a, a, a reconstruction at the top. You can see it looks like a mammal. It has hair, it has whiskers, it has the general vibe of, uh, vibe of a little mouse or rat or something like that. And little is the operative word because that photo on the bottom is a fossilized jawbone of one of these first mammals. And that is a grain of rice next to it for scale. So as mammals originated, getting really small was part of that. And being small was probably a survival strategy to survive during the time of dinosaurs. Now, the thing that makes mammals mammals, the defining feature, the thing that those cynodont survivors of the great extinction then developed and then became true mammals, the thing that scientists, we've decided, defines what a mammal is, is another thing that seems kind of subtle, but it turns out to be important. And that is in the ancestors of mammals, including in the dimetrodons and the cynodonts. The lower jaw was made up of a bunch of different bones. And this is true of most animals. It's true of frogs and lizards and dinosaurs and birds and so on. But we have only a single bone. We have a jaw bone. And so our mammal ancestors, they, they lost or changed a lot of the bones in their lower jaw, leaving only a single strong solid bone, the bone that had all the teeth, a single bone where all the muscles could attach to, and it was this new streamlined strong lower jaw that allowed these mammals to chew their food really well. And with the development of this jaw came the full set of mammal teeth, the incisors and canines and premolars and molars. With those teeth, these teeth that as we know from our own mouth, when you put your teeth together, they interlock firmly. The top ones join up to the bottom ones. That's what allows us to chew our food. That is something really unusual. Dinosaurs can't chew their food that way. Lizards, crocodiles can't do that. But in order for that to happen, you need to pretty much have the same teeth in your mouth throughout your lives. You can't just be changing teeth and growing new teeth all the time like reptiles do. And therefore, these first mammals, they totally change their teeth so that there's only one set of baby teeth, one set of adult teeth, and that's it. And with that also came the advent of milk, of this new way of feeding babies, which turned out to be very important because milk is the sustainable, nutritious food source. 
and it really helps mammals get a leg up in life. All of these things were happening as these first mammals were shrinking in size and trying to endure in a world dominated by dinosaurs. Meanwhile, the brains of these early mammals were getting bigger and bigger. And the very first mammals had huge brains compared to any of the lizards or, or frogs or, or other animals that were around at the time. And the development of milk to feed babies probably enabled brains to get larger because, again, this was a sustainable, readily available food source that babies would always get from their mothers. Very nutritious. Now, all of this was happening as the first mammals were trying to endure underfoot of the dinosaurs. And we have some record of this time from here in Scotland, in a beautiful place, a place where I go and collect fossils. Uh, every year with my students, with my colleagues, and this is a place called the Isle of Skye. Now, I don't, no, sorry, I know the bar is a bit annoying. I don't quite know how to get it to go, but I'm going to put it down there for now because we're going to see some stuff at the top of the screen that's going to be more interesting. So this is the Isle of Skye, this beautiful, enchanting place off the west coast of Scotland. A lot of Hollywood blockbusters are filmed there because the landscape is so magical, these mountains and cliffs and moors. And some of these rocks fringing the coast are Jurassic in age. They're about 170 million years old, and they have fossils in them. Now, every year I bring my uh, students there, and my students always find the best fossils. And the prime example of that is this is uh, in the middle. This is Amelia. She was a student a few years ago. And what she's pointing at is the skull of a pterodactyl, one of those reptiles that flew overhead of the dinosaurs. And that skull leads to a skeleton. And just a few months ago, we announced this as a new species of pterodactyl with an eight foot wingspan, this huge flying animal, the biggest flying animal of its time. And I'd love to say more about it, but it's not a mammal. So we'd be getting sidetracked there. But this is just to show that the students always find the best fossils. Now that pterodactyl is pretty big, but we're always on the lookout for small things too. And this is Moji, one of our students who came from Nigeria to do a master's with us. We have a, a one-year master's program in paleontology at the University of Edinburgh, which I lead, and Moji came to do this. And here she is looking for tiny little fossils because you can find mammals. And this, although it may not look like much, it may look like a bit of roadkill, but that's a good thing because this is the skeleton of a mammal that fossilized and was found on the Isle of Skye. And it was found a few decades ago and largely forgotten about. But at the time it was found, it was one of the only skeletons of a mammal that was known from the time of dinosaurs. It was a rare gem. But now, thankfully, things have improved and there are more fossils and better fossils of these mammals living in the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous with the dinosaurs. And the best ones are found in China, in far northeastern China, in a place called Liaoning Province. It's way off the tourist trail. It shares a long border with North Korea. This is a land of rolling hills, of factories, of farms. And about 25 years ago, farmers out working their land started to notice some pretty peculiar things in the rocks. And these were dinosaur skeletons covered in feathers, the famous feathered dinosaurs, the things that proved once and for all that today's birds came from dinosaurs. But these things were so well preserved because their entire ecosystems were buried by volcanoes, almost Pompeii style, locking all these fossils in place, which means it's not just dinosaurs that are found there, but there's lizards and there's salamanders and there's fish and there's plants and there's insects and there are mammals too. And I've been very privileged to be able to see some of these mammals as farmers have brought them into museums in China that I've worked with. And here's a photo that I snapped a few years ago when I was in China and I was brought back to the storehouse of a museum in Liaoning and a new shipment of fossils had just arrived. And here some of my friends in China are looking at this new fossil, which turns out to be about the size of an apple with fur all around it. It's the skeleton of a mammal. And these Chinese fossils, they have been a game changer. They are gorgeously preserved. You see the fur, you see the whiskers, you see the delicate little bones. And they tell us very importantly that mammals during the time of dinosaurs were a lot more interesting than we used to think. Now they were small, 
And as far as we know, during the 150 million years that mammals and dinosaurs lived together, mammals never got bigger than a house cat. But although they were small, these mammals were sublime in so many ways. It's true that the dinosaurs kept the mammals small. Mammals didn't have space or an opportunity to get bigger. T. rexes and triceratops has held those roles in ecosystems. But conversely, mammals did the opposite to dinosaurs. Mammals kept dinosaurs big. You never saw a T. rex the size of a mouse or a triceratops the size of a rat because mammals held and dominated those small niches. Mammals became experts at living in the shadows, underground, living incognito, coming out at night. And although they were small, they were incredibly diverse. There were mammals that climbed trees, mammals that were burrowers, mammals that were swimmers, there were even mammals that had skin wings that they used to glide between the trees of the canopy. So you can see this animal here. And there were even some mammals that turned the classic evolutionary story on its head. This is one called Repenimamus. This was one of the larger mammals that lived with dinosaurs. It was about the size of a house cat or a badger. And it was found buried by one of those volcanoes in China. And its last meal was found fossilized in its stomach. And that last meal was a baby dinosaur. So this was a mammal that ate dinosaurs. Now, the more we look, we find amazing fossils of, of mammals living with dinosaurs in other places. I've done a lot of fieldwork in Romania where we literally pluck mammal skeletons from these riverbeds. And we found some really neat ones, including a lot of fossils of these types of mammals called multi-tuberculates. And they would have looked a little bit like rodents. They were not rodents. Rodents, as you'll see, came much later. But these were small mammals that mostly ate plants, but they could eat a variety of foods, and they proliferated, especially in the Cretaceous period, the last stage of the age of dinosaur. And they proliferated because they were really good at eating a new type of food that had just evolved, and these were flowering plants. Up until this point in Earth history, there were no fruits or no flowers. They developed only in the Cretaceous period. And then they diversified, and mammals diversified with them. It was an evolutionary arms race. And these fossils we find in Romania record that. We find so many of these mammals. They were actually really, really common and very diverse. Now, in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, while all of this was happening, the continents are continuing to move around. The supercontinent is broken up. It's a distant memory. The world is starting to look more like it does today. And it was this kind of world that was rudely interrupted one Tuesday evening, let's say, 66 million years ago when this six mile wide asteroid traveling faster than a speeding bullet fell out of the sky and smashed into what is now Mexico with the force of over one billion nuclear weapons put together. And it punched a hole in the crust over a hundred miles wide. And it changed everything. This was the single worst day in the history of life, I'm pretty confident. Almost immediately, it triggered wildfires, tsunamis, earthquakes, and then all the dust and grime from the collision and all the soot from the wildfires went into the atmosphere, blocked out the sun. The earth went dark and cold. It was a global nuclear winter that lasted several years, maybe even up to a decade. Plants didn't have sunlight. They couldn't photosynthesize. They died. The forest collapsed. Plant-eating dinosaurs and other animals didn't have any food to eat. They died. The meat-eaters then didn't have any food to eat. They died. Ecosystems collapsed like houses of cards, and the dinosaurs could not endure. T. rex was there when that asteroid hit. Triceratops was there. Duck-billed dinosaurs like this were there when that asteroid hit. But it seems like they just couldn't deal with it. They were too big. It took them too long to grow from babies into adults. They couldn't hide or hunker down or burrow very easily. They had very specialized diets. So when the forest collapsed, they were in big trouble. They had been dominant for so long, but at this sudden moment of global catastrophe and global ecological and climate change, the dinosaurs couldn't cope. But we had ancestors that stared down that asteroid. 
mammals made it through, obviously, or else we wouldn't be having this discussion. And a big part of my research has turned to that extinction and what happened afterwards and how mammals were able to make it through. And I've done a lot of work in New Mexico, one of the best records in the world of the last dinosaurs and the mammals that took over from them. I bring my students out there. I've trained my students. This is Sarah, my first PhD student. She's now one of the world experts in these mammals. And we find some amazing fossils in New Mexico. And some of these mammals, these fossils are only from a few hundred thousand years after the asteroid. That's nothing in terms of geological time. What we see in New Mexico is so soon after the asteroid, two things happen. First of all, remember that mammals for 150 million years lived with dinosaurs, but they never got bigger than a house cat. But lo and behold, once the dinosaurs are gone, within a few hundred thousand years, we have fossils of mammals the size of pigs. Within a million or two years, fossils of mammals the size of cows. So mammals took advantage and they ballooned in size and they started filling a lot of those ecological niches that dinosaurs once had. The other thing we see in New Mexico is that these new bigger mammals are almost all one particular type of mammal. They are placental mammals, mammals like us that gave live birth to well-developed babies. And we can tell that from the fossils. Now in today's world, there are over 6,000 species of mammals and the vast majority of them, about 95%, are placentals. The other mammals are marsupials, things like koalas and kangaroos, and the only North American one, the possum. These are the ones that give birth to tiny little premature babies that they raise longer in a pouch. And then there's a few monotremes stuck down in Australia, the species that are so primitive they still lay eggs. That, these are the mammals alive today. And again, the vast majority are placentals like us. So bats and whales and elephants and dogs and cats and bears and so on are all placentals as we are. And the blossoming of placental mammals happened after the extinction, after the asteroid, culminating in the great diversity of placentals today. Now, why were placentals able to make it through the asteroid? It seems like actually most mammals died when the asteroid hit, but the placentals and the few other mammals that made it through they were small, they could burrow, they could hide easily, they could eat a wide variety of foods, they were generalists. They grew fast, they reproduced fast. That was a good hand of cards to be holding when that asteroid came. And it was from those lucky ancestors that of course we and all these other modern day mammals emerged. Now there's still a lot of mysteries about the placental mammals living soon after the extinction. We don't really know where they fit on the family tree of mammals. This is a big part of my research now, trying to pin down the family tree, the relationships of these mammals living within the first few hundred thousand or first few million years after the asteroid. We know they're placentals. We can tell that from their skeleton and, and, and the, the growth lines and the textures of their bones and all kinds of subtle things that, you know, anatomists are good at finding. But we don't know, are, are, are they early bats or whales or horses? Are they completely dead end, extinct groups of placental mammals? We don't know. A big part of the research in my lab is trying to pin that down, but we're learning more about what these animals were like. And earlier this year, we published a paper led by Ornella here as one of my postdocs. And in this paper, we used CAT scanners to digitally look inside the skulls of fossil mammals using the x-rays to build digital models of the brain. And we found something unexpected, that the mammals that survived the extinction and proliferated afterwards. They got so big so fast that their brains did not keep pace. Their bodies got really big, their brains only got a little bit bigger. And so actually the relative size of their brain to their body actually declined for several million years. And it's the relative brain size that really matters for intelligence. So our mammal ancestors that stared down the asteroid proliferated afterwards, they actually got dumber in doing so. It wasn't big brains and keen intelligence that helped them survive and helped them become ascendant. It was getting bigger bodies that did. That was a really unexpected result. The other thing, we just published this last week. Greg, one of my postdocs, led this study that was published in Nature last week that we're very excited about, where by cutting up the teeth of these mammals, we can see tiny growth lines, daily growth lines, because teeth grow incrementally. We can also study the chemistry of these teeth. And we can see 
the places in the tooth, the growth lines that uh, were recorded during birth and during weaning. Because when an animal is born, there's a change in its body chemistry. When, it, when a, a baby mammal stops drinking milk and turns to solid food, there's another change in its body chemistry. We know this from modern mammals. Shockingly, what we see is that some of these mammals that were living right after the asteroid, they raise their babies for seven months in the womb. And those babies drank milk for one or two months, then started to eat solid food, then became mature and started reproducing themselves about a year later. This was a live fast growth strategy that helped them. But more than anything, being able to, to, to keep a baby in the womb for the long, a long time, that allowed bigger babies to be born. That was the key that allowed these mammals to be able to grow to larger sizes after the dinosaurs died. Anyway, I could go on about these mammals for ages. And I'm going to start going fast here now because we covered such a vast distance. And in the last 10 minutes or so, I want to bring you to the modern world. Now, these mammals that lived right after the asteroid, again, we don't really know where they fit on the family tree. We know they're placentals. We don't know much more. But about 10 million years after the asteroid, there's this amazing fossil site in Germany. It's a big hole in the ground. It was all, almost turned into a landfill. But instead, it became a UNESCO World Heritage Site because the fossils that are found in these rocks are so exquisite. And these are fossils of things that we can start to recognize as modern types of mammals. These things are horses. These things are primates, unequivocally, undoubtedly. Now, they're a little bit weird. That horse there is only the size of a poodle. So horses started small. Those primates, they don't quite look like any primates today. But clearly, these are early members of the mammal groups that we all know and love, including our, our very own group. Now, during this time interval, which is called the Eocene period, mammals start to do some really wacky things. And you start to see some mammals become so big and so strange looking, it's almost like they're trying to become dinosaurs. And these include things like Paraceratherium here, which was a rhinoceros, one without any horns, but a rhino nonetheless, the largest land mammal that ever lived, somewhere in the vicinity of 20 tons in weight. A huge animal. What mammals would get bigger? Now, also in this Eocene period, as we start to see the more modern mammal groups, we see fossils like these. This is obviously a bat. Bats, an amazing feat of evolution. The only mammals that can truly fly with flapping powered flight. As we saw earlier, some older mammals had wings that they used to glide. Bats are flapping flyers. Only birds and pterodactyls have been able to develop this superpower among animals with bones. And it was the superpower that allowed bats to become the first global group of mammals they spread all over the world in the Eocene time. And it also is one of the things that makes them today one of the most diverse groups of animals out there. A huge percentage of all mammals are bats. There are bats everywhere and there's lots of species. There is another group of mammals in the Eocene that started to do something unusual. This is a, a mammal here that maybe when you look at it, it kind of has the general bearing of a dog or a wolf. You know, you look at that long snout and you look at those pointy teeth. But look at those hands and feet. They kind of look like the paddles or the flippers of a scuba diver. And this animal, believe it or not, is one of the very first whales. Whales evolved from land living mammals. There were once whales that walked. And over time in the Eocene, beginning around 55 ish to 50 ish million years ago, these whales detached themselves from the land and moved fully into the water. We have a beautiful sequence of transitional fossils that shows how an ancestor that looked like a small deer, how an ancestor that basically was Bambi over time turned into Moby Dick. And I would love to spend more time going on about whale evolution, but I talk more in the book about this wonderful sequence of fossils, one of the best examples in the fossil record of an evolutionary transition of one type of animal suitable for one type of environment changes into something totally different. And you can find stunning fossils like uh, of some of these early whales like these here in Egypt. Just look at the splendor of these first giant whale bones, and here they are eroding out of the desert. Today, there are whales, 
A lot of them are heavily endangered, but today's whales include the very largest animals that have ever lived in the history of Earth, the blue whale. This is an animal the size of a submarine. It's like 100 feet long, weighs 100 tons or more. Imagine if blue whales were extinct and all we had were some petrified bones. I'm sure we would hold them in as much esteem, maybe even more esteem than we hold the dinosaurs. So I think we need to appreciate whales. It bears repeating. They are the biggest things that have ever lived. They are alive right now. And let's make sure we keep them that way. And this just goes to show how big a blue whale is. There's a colleague of mine next to a blue whale skull. To this blue whale, he would just be a little piece of popcorn. These are massive, monstrous behemoth animals. Now, the Eocene then was the time where a lot of this change was happening, and you start to see the more modern mammal groups enter the fossil record. Now, as the Eocene unfolded, two places became islands unto themselves, South America and Africa, and they both incubated a lot of their own bizarre animals. On Africa, elephants evolved. They started small, just the size of little dogs, and they, of course, ended in giants. In South America, there was an entire group of strange hoofed mammals that kind of looked like Frankenstein creatures, a little bit of horse, a little bit of rodent, a little bit of elephant. Charles Darwin discovered a lot of their fossils. He was confused by them. He didn't know what to make of them. And it was only a few years ago that the discovery of some DNA in some of these bones allowed scientists to finally figure out that these things are members of the horse group which was a really shocking revelation. So South America, Africa, they were their island continents, developing their own animals in isolation. Meanwhile, the entire world in the Eocene was really a jungle world. It was hot. Global temperatures ran hot. But then, as the Eocene turned into the Oligocene, the next interval of time, the Earth started to get cooler and cooler. And this had to do with changing ocean currents and changes in the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. What that meant was those jungles started to get patchier and patchier, and they were replaced by more open expanses where grasses grew. Grasses are very hardy. They can grow really fast. They can deal with droughts better. They can deal with cooler and drier climates better than big jungles can. This was the first time in Earth history there were grasslands. Most dinosaurs would have never even seen a blade of grass. No dinosaur would have seen a savanna or a prairie. It's only now, but just a few tens of millions of years ago, that grasslands developed. And as they did so, new animals evolved to live in those wider open spaces. If you were in North America about 12 million years ago, if you were in Nebraska, let's say, you would have been able to go on safari back then. There were rhinos, there were camels, there were horses. You can find their fossils in this amazing site where an entire ecosystem was buried by a volcano, the Yellowstone Volcano, in fact, and this is called the Ashfall Fossil Beds. Now, also living on those savannas, chasing down and eating a lot of those uh, safari-type animals were all kinds of new predators, including some antecedents of dogs and cats and bears, but other things that were just completely terrifying and thankfully extinct, like these bear dogs, like some bizarre, terrifying mashup of both groups. That was in North America. Meanwhile, in Australia, things were proceeding at a different pace. And the, the rainforest stayed there much, much, much longer. And it was only very recently that grasslands came to Australia. But there's some amazing fossils from Australia that are found in the outback, way, way, way out in the outback. And these fossils are almost all marsupials. Remember those mammals that have pouches that they, where they raise their tiny little babies. There's not many of them left anymore. There used to be more of them. Today, almost all of them live in Australia and in South America. Basically, their ancestors made it to those two island continents. And it was in those two places where they found their refuge. It was only very recently that opossums came up from South America into North America. But we see beautiful fossil marsupials in Australia. This reminds us that not, you know, all the world is not the same when it comes to mammals. And there have been some terrifying marsupials, marsupials that looked like wolves and like lions that lived not too long ago in Australia. Now, very recently, the Earth has continued to cool, 
And a few million years ago, the Earth got really cold. And this was the time of the Ice Age. There have been many Ice Ages in Earth history, but this is the one that we call the Ice Age. And in fact, the Ice Age has been a series of times where it's cold and glaciers expand far onto the continents and times when it warms up and those glaciers retreat. And those glaciers, by the way, are the polar ice cap. <clears throat> and so this has happened many times, but only a few tens of thousands of years ago, where you are right now would have been covered by ice of the polar ice cap. It's astounding to think about it. And these glaciers in places would have been a mile thick. So Chicago, you know, which is basically where I'm from, would have been covered with a mile thick sheet of ice. It, it's just crazy to think about it. Now, living in this Ice Age world were a lot of the megafauna mammals, these giant mammals that um, are so familiar to us. Woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers and mastodons and giant ground sloths and armadillos the size of Volkswagens and beavers bigger than humans and deer with antlers the size of a dinner table. And in Australia, there were wombats that weighed three tons and there were kangaroos that were too plump to hop. These mammals were so well adapted to that Ice Age world, but they've all gone extinct. And they all went extinct quite recently, only about 10,000 years ago. And here's some more of this spectacular megafauna. And there's some great stories. Thomas Jefferson actually studied the bones of the extinct giant ground sloth. He presented a research paper, a scientific paper on these bones less than a week after he was inaugurated as the second vice president in US history. So just imagine that, you know, a sitting vice president going to a scientific conference and presenting a lecture on fossil bones. That's what Jefferson did. He was obsessed by these Ice Age megafauna. What particularly obsessed him was whether or not they were extinct. This was the big debate of the day. Were they actually all dead or maybe they, some of them were still living off in unexplored expanses of the earth? Well, the more people looked, the more they saw, they couldn't find these things anywhere. They must be dead. We now know, of course, that many of them are extinct, and it was probably us, Homo sapiens, that did it, because we knew these animals. We encountered these animals. We hunted these animals. We drew their paintings on cave walls. And wherever our species went, the megafauna soon disappeared. And I will very quickly end here with a few words about humans. This talk and my book is not about humans. Humans are just one part of the mammal story. I don't want it to seem like all of mammal history, this 325 million years, was just some coronation march on the inevitable line to human dominance. That's not what it is. We are one of many groups of mammals, but we are a pretty unique group. We have huge brains and consciousness and the ability to work in groups. We are pretty special. And the human story begins about five or six million years ago, when a type of ape came down from the trees in Africa and started walking only on his hind legs. And after that, its hands were free to do things like hunt and, and, and make tools. And it was then that the brains got bigger. And we see a, a sequence of these fossils showing how apes came down from the trees, started walking upright, grew huge brains, and became humans. But there used to be many species of humans. And up until about 40,000 years ago, there were always multiple species of humans. And these species would have interacted with each other, sometimes even bred with each other. Neanderthals are a prime example of this. They were another species of human that we, our Homo sapiens ancestors, encountered and fought with and interbred with. And that seems strange because today we are a single species that stands alone. But is it really that weird? There's many different types of cats in today's world. There's many different species of rodents in today's world. So why not humans? And that's what it was. But here we are now alone as the only species of human pondering where we came from. And we have spread all over. Our one species, Homo sapiens, has spread across the entire earth. And we've even started to go further afield. And how much farther afield we go in the future is hard to say. But no matter where we go in the future, we are affecting the earth today. And we're affecting it in many ways. And mammals right now are maybe at the most perilous position they've been in since the asteroid. 
About 350 species of mammals have gone extinct since Homo sapiens began moving around the world. Now, I'm not going to end on a big note of doom and gloom. I'm not going to go too far into this. But I just want to make that point that we have such a vast and deep evolutionary heritage. We should appreciate it and we should conserve it so that things like lions and elephants and rhinos do not go the way of the woolly mammoth and the saber-toothed tiger. So with that, I thank you for your attention and letting me indulge you with this. I know the talk is, you know, a bit long, and but I have about five minutes for questions. I'm sorry it's not more, um, but uh, it's coming up to midnight here. But I'm very oh, yeah. happy to take any questions that anybody has now. And if anybody has any burning questions, please, you know, you can, my email is easy to find. Otherwise, I hope it inspires you to check out the book if you haven't already, because maybe the answers to your questions will be in the book. But thank you all very much for your attention. Okay, we'll take just a few questions because like you mentioned, it's getting till uh, midnight almost there in Scotland. Um, so we have Mary that asks, what role did ma mam mammalian glands have in development of mammals? <laughs> yes, so this is all about, you know, milk, being able to feed babies milk. Only mammals do this. It's a really remarkable thing. And this evolved around the time that we changed our, our jaw bones of many bones, you know, of our ancestors into a single bone and we evolved our full complement of teeth, and we evolved, you know, teeth that could match up, the upper and lower teeth that could interlock and chew food. All of this was developing together way back in the Triassic and the Jurassic, as these mammals, these tiny mammals are trying to endure in a dinosaur world. And the, and the development of milk was a big deal. I mean, just think about it. You know, a, a mother or father bird has to go out and find worms and find food for their babies. Other animals, the babies have to go out and find food themselves oftentimes. For mammals, the mothers can bring the food to them. And that just opens up a whole new world of possibilities. It keeps those babies safer. It allows them to get bigger. It allows them to develop bigger brains and so on. So it's incredibly important. Okay, uh, we have a question that talks, you talked a little bit about the branches that went out there, but um, Jan asks, if mammals outlived dinosaurs, how did reptiles survive too? Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, different reptiles, snakes, lizards, crocodiles, turtles that also uh, survived the asteroid. Um, some of those groups came very close to dying out and just eked it through. Others like the crocodiles and turtles, um, they seem to have done quite well. Um, and didn't suffer many extinctions. And there's debate about that, but it seems like things like crocodiles and turtles were often parts of ecosystems that were not um, land ecosystems. They were more rivers and ponds and so on. So they didn't have plants at the base of the food chain in those ecosystems. So when the forests collapse, the land ecosystems are devastated, but those river and lake and pond ecosystems had detritus, like organ, uh, decaying organic matter um, at the base of the food chain. And in fact, it was probably a good time to be in one of those food chains. Okay, we have a question from Edward and he says, is there a next step in evolution? There's always something new in evolution. It's, it's unpredictable in many ways. So, you know, we are continuing to evolve uh, and animals and plants are continuing to evolve around us. Um, but uh, as for what to predict, I, I would be a fool to to try to predict. <laughs> so I, in, in your book, I found it interesting. You said, uh, and I quote, uh, we are still on an ice stage. Uh, greenhouse gases are just suppressing it. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Yes, the ice age uh, started about two and a half million years ago. This is when the glaciers crept down from the North Pole far onto the continents. And since then, it's really been a roller coaster ride. This back and forth ebb of climate cools and the glaciers advance further, climate warms a bit, the glaciers retreat back and back and forth and back and forth. And the last glacial episode ended about 10,000 years ago. And nothing has really changed with the Earth. We're just in one of the lull periods now. So we will go back to another glacial pulse unless we heat the earth so much that those glaciers can't grow. And that's probably the case. So that's maybe one uh, kind of unexpected uh, good thing that comes from global warming. 
Okay, uh, we saved the best for last, if you will. So your last question, you talked about this just at the end, the walking whales. What would drive the whale ancestors to go from land to sea? And how long did it fully take for this aquatic evolution to happen? It's an incredible story. And I flesh it out in the book. And I know it's kind of kitschy to say, read the book. But uh, since we're running out of time, you'll just have to read the book. But, um, but it took several million years. And the, the first whale ancestors that started to experiment with the water were these things that looked like little deer. And they were land landlady animals. They had hooves, they could run, but they had denser bones and they even had ear bones that were good at hearing underwater. So it seems like they probably would go into the water, maybe to escape from predators. Maybe there was some food in the water that they liked to eat, but, it, but they were primarily land animals that started to experiment with the water. You know, they weren't swimmers, they weren't, you know, fully adapted, but they were just making a little encroachment. And it was from them that then natural selection continued to shape uh, these animals and made them more and more adapted to the water. And over time, those hoofed, you know, hands and feet turned into flippers and so on. And, and, and they got, these animals got bigger and bigger. And then they got to a point where they could no longer move on the land. They were completely divorced from the land and they or it went all into the oceans. And we see this step by step in the fossil record. We have a beautiful fossil record. It's like a flip book of stage by stage by stage. Um, one of the best examples of an evolutionary transition. So um, I'm sorry I can't take more questions. I'll just say that you know my email is easy to find. So do look me up if you have any burning questions. I actually see the list of, of questions and I just see the final one I'm gonna answer from Nathan. Have you met Chris Pratt? Yes. <laughs> I have, just to end it on some name dropping, but yes, I visited the set and I uh, saw Chris and, and Bryce Howard and Omar C. Wow. In this little scene and chatted with them, and uh, I found them to all be very nice people. And it was it was a you know small interaction, but but um, that's true of everybody in the film. I I, I met uh, you know all of them except for Sam Neill. He's the only one I unfortunately never crossed paths with, but they're all super super great actors it was really fun to play a small role in the film and to kind of bask in a little bit of that hollywood glow it's one of those life moments so <laughs> we'll end with that but thank you everybody i really appreciate it sorry i couldn't stay longer next time i'll have to visit you in person uh and we yeah we'd love to have you here in hudson so thanks for taking the time i know it's well after midnight so we do all appreciate you talking about your newest book and uh, we look forward to more research on mammal fossils. Well, thank you very, very much. And stay safe, stay well, everybody, and Thanks. see you down the line. Okay, okay. sounds great. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Bye.